The Unshackled Waves, episode 173. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company, and I'm not overstating things when I say it's been a pretty intense week, both around the nation and for us and our associates here at The Unshackled. Our Brisbane Bureau Chief Martin Hartwig was violently assaulted while covering the final event of Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux's Australian tour on Sunday night by the local Antifa who were protesting the event. He had to go to hospital with a broken eye socket and fractured hand. The Unshackled also aimed to cover the uh, uh, protest Uh, by the local African community and campaign against racism and fascism outside uh, uh, Channel 7 to protest their uh, coverage of African crime on Saturday. But upon arrival, police removed our Melbourne Bureau Chief Morgan Munro, who had to film it from a distance. However, uh, Neil Erickson, uh, Bluebeard and the Young Conservative were all detained by police and moved across town for uh, for an alleged breach of the peace. Super Saturday delivered a resounding victory for the Labor Party, winning all four seats that they previously held, including the marginal seats of Longman and Braddon, with swings to them. Meanwhile, the Coalition lost all three seats they contested, including the previous Blue Ribbon seat of Mayo. Australia's mainstream media is also up for a big shake-up with the merger of Nine Entertainment Co. and Fairfax Media, which rather than being a sign of further media concentration, it's actually a sign that the mainstream media is weak and on its last legs. This Waves episode is going to be a bit different in that the first half of the show we'll be speaking with Martin Hartwig about how the assault unfolded on Sunday night and a check-in on how he's doing. We will then be joined by the Young Conservative to discuss his experience about being detained on Saturday. Then in the second half we'll continue with the normal review of the week with the Unshackled's political editor Michael Smythe, but first let's bring in Martin. Martin, how are you doing? Uh, I've been better. Oh, well, certainly uh, at, at the Unshackled, I just want to say from the beginning, we don't expect our uh, reporters to, to take a, a hit for us, but uh, you certainly uh, got, our, got our support and uh, you know, we're, we're wishing you a, a speedy recovery. But we thought that we'd have you on the show this week just to get your uh, first-hand opinion on, on what uh, happened. You were obviously at the Stefan Molyneux and uh, Lauren Southern Brisbane uh, event, which was counter-protested by the, the local uh, Antifa. Now, how did you come to encounter these protesters? Okay, well, the um, anti-fascist action Brisbane page said that they were planning a protest for the corners of um, the, the corner at the main entrance of uh, the convention centre. So earlier on, I was there doing just sort of scouting, and I noticed there was a, uh, someone scouting around, um, and he, he, he looked a bit sus. So I. Um, I sort of trailed him, and I noticed he went back to uh, went up to Musgrave Park. So earlier on in the evening, there's a live video of me in that park where an uh, undercover or a plainclothes uh, police negotiator asked me to uh, to leave because they were uh, I might mess up the rapport with the uh, with the Antifa. So I left. Um, I went into the uh, around the conference and covered some of the uh, the protests outside. Then I uh, went into the conference. Um, because I'd already been in the Melbourne one, I was kind of, I got bored, like I'd, I'd heard all the speeches before. So, um, somewhat foolishly, I decided to go out and try and get some more footage. Um, and I I went up to, uh, near the corner where Musgrave Park is there on, on Cordelia Street. And um, as soon as they saw me, they were across the street around the fire pit. There's like a traditional fire pit or whatever in the in Musgrave Park there and uh, they immediately started hurling personalized insults at me um, that female who was in the live feed who was also on uh, yelling against racist dogs where she was um, abusing that uh, proud boy um, she she was the one who was I, I firmly believe because I've cross reference I've cross checked the audio it's the same person so that female was egging the group on basically. 
Yeah, and the, you captured it all on your new, new GoPro camera that yep. you uh, purchased the, the the day before. Now, uh, I, I've, when they started hurling uh, abuse at you, I've seen the, the the footage. They you gave it right back to them. You you weren't going to cow down and let the the ins, insults uh, stand. So there yeah. there was obvious and, and obviously with a, a group such as antifa they're, uh, they're they're going to get more agitated and and heated so it certainly uh raised uh, tensions between both of you many people have said i should have walked away and perhaps i should have um and i shouldn't have been up there alone and that's true as well they weren't saying that about uh i feel i feel horrible saying this but Eudris dixon found herself in a similar predicament i could have died like with what happened to me if they had have continued with the assault um, or if more people had joined in and would they have said to me, you know, you shouldn't have gone up to Musgrave Park. So it doesn't really matter what the taunts were back and forth. It doesn't justify this, this level of assault and grievous bodily harm. And, uh, yeah. And remember that provocation, it's never a defense to assault or any other type of crime, uh, these days. Yeah, exactly. Um. And the two uh, guys that attacked you, they actually uh, ran across the road because you were on one side of the road. The, the woman who was speaking on their behalf, it seemed, was on the other side of the road. They actually ran, ran towards you when the, the assault happened. And uh, did, uh, did they actually throw soy at you? Was that, was that actually the case? Yeah, you can see, well, in the video, um, this this uh, in the audio i'm going oh some he's got some juice look out he's got juice and as he got halfway across the intersection he goes oh i heard you like soy milk or something and he throws it on me it got all over my my lovely chinos that they were <laughs> making so much fun of earlier on in the evening um but yeah so it was basically just a carton of soy milk I, I guess they thought it was a bit of a joke but they also seemingly had bottles of urine prepared and we'll have a look at the uh, uh, the footage of them running over now. You are an Aussie. I'm oh, so this guy's got juice. He's got Aussie. juice. Oh my God, he's got soy. soy. I heard you wanted some soy, man. Here, yeah. it's for you. It's for Ooh. you, bro. Fucking soy. Come on, dude. You want to fucking go, cut? better than that you can do better three on one now obviously after afterwards you realized the the full extent of your injuries and and had to go to hospital now can you just yeah, yeah describe uh yeah the the full extent of uh your injuries yeah so after after they left um i sort of w i went back walked back across the intersection where i'd been attacked and um, the adrenaline started to wear off a bit. And um, yeah, I walked down towards the main entrance of the convention center and I saw a few officers out the front. So I approached them um, and we walked through the convention center to, yeah, uh, they, uh, we went to the police station. I did a statement and all of that. They took my shirt, which was um, in tatters. Um, they took my shirt for forensics, to see if they can get any maybe some of the blood that was on it wasn't mine who knows but yeah so uh it was when we went to the hospital they gave me a ct scan to check for uh concussions no concussions this head's built with uh superior german engineering mate can't kick this in so um yeah but my hand is another story so we have to get that put in a cast temporarily and it looks like it might need a uh need an operation so recovery will take a while yeah, uh, it certainly sounds uh, very I intense. I mean, uh, the, the fact that you've got a, a fractured uh, hand, I mean, that's that's pretty uh, serious uh, in injury. Now, the uh, the stor uh, story about what happened to you, it uh, became uh, public uh, yes yesterday. And yeah. I know uh, just from myself, I got lots of messages from other alt media people saying whoa i just heard what what happened to your mate is he okay i've i couldn't believe that uh the, the local antifa did that have you uh been getting uh, a lot of uh support from from people messaging you 
yeah, I've been getting a lot of support even from people I don't know. I've been getting random messages. I mean, I did, I have, I have received a bit of, uh, you know, a lot of people have been quite doubtful and you've got your hyenas on the side, you know, your keyboard warriors going, oh, they should have finished the job or that, you know, um, but it's been, it's been mixed, but largely overall, probably 90, 95% of what I've seen has been positive and, and supportive. Um, so that's been, that's been really good to see. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting, uh, these, uh, given that the, the state we're currently in and the, the, uh, the culture war, there's, uh, a lot of people who've been anticipating these kinds of, you know, confrontations. And so there's been a lot of people, especially, uh, the, the proud boys saying like, oh, you know, good on you for like taking one for the cause. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll see, we'll see what comes of it because it'll be worth it if we can, if, if this will lead to investigations that will dismantle Brisbane Antifa, that'd be lovely. You know, these, these, these people don't belong on the streets with, with regular law abiding, polite citizenry. They... Well, let's talk a bit about uh, Brisbane Antifa because obviously Melbourne has the, the reputation for the, having the worst Antifa and the, the campaign against uh, racism and fascism. And there's still this stereotype that Queensland's a uh, conservative uh, state, but the, the local Antifa out there, they're, they're, they're pretty active and their online page, uh, they, they, they dish out, you know, a lot of abuse. There's a lot of uh, posturing. And uh, as we saw, we, with you, they're out on the streets now. Yeah, they're out on the streets, but they won't fight one on one. There's there's footage of this uh, this gentleman. We know who he is. He's got a nice red bandana. He's got his little flag. He's all wearing black, and he's standing in the street, blocking the blocking the traffic. You know, in his little posing. Um, and he he walked down the street on his own past me, and he said he said some stuff to me, and he could have had a go, but he didn't. He walked on. He's a coward. You won't fight one on one. So, um, you know, they might be active online, and they might be, they might be really brave when they're in a group when they got their masks on. But I doubt they'd be so brave if they if they were fighting people, you know, in a group who could actually, yeah. Uh, often with these on. Antifa groups, they counter protest at uh, at. Uh, events such as these they're they're always months in the planning like they they plan yeah. their their strategy if they ever ambush themselves they they just won't engage yeah yeah so um yeah they've they've, they've got um they've got a pretty thick tac uh, book of tactics so you know, the anti uh, anti fascist and black bloc tactics have been happening for quite some time now so they've got you know the the depth of experience from um those in Europe, I mean, it's massive in Europe. You saw during the uh, the G20 in, I think it was Munich or Germany, it was absolute, absolutely rabid. The whole city was shut down by these um, by these groups. You know, they were burning garbage in the streets, hurling beer bottles at the police. Um, it's, it's insane. And it, I find it hard to believe that they wouldn't have profiles uh, on all of these people because you, 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 you see, I mean, at, at the event, in the live feed, in the main entrance, they're holding up a sign that says, give Nazis butterflies, and it's got a picture of a butterfly knife. If that isn't inciting political, uh, politically motivated violence, then I don't know what is, honestly. And they were standing right across from police who, who, who could have unmasked them if they thought that they were a risk to the peace. But for some reason, they decided not to. Uh, we hope that, uh, I, I know that uh, the, uh, the Unshackled has said that a group such as Antifa should be listed as a, a terrorist uh, organization. We hope that uh, authorities and uh, those in government, even those on the left side of politics, uh, start to realize what a threat this group is. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're a threat to the public order, but they're not a threat to the state. You know, they call themselves anarchists, but they're actually foot soldiers for big government. Because these actions uh, that they do, they they justify when they come out and they, they show up to protest these events. They seek to cause as much um, financial strain on the state as possible, but that also um, gives the police um, more available funding. They can go, oh, okay, we need to respond to this, so we need the funding. So call me a wacky conspiracy theorist, but it it it, it seems awfully uh, convenient that these these groups are allowed to 
to operate unhindered. Well, Martin, uh, thank you for um, sharing your uh, experience uh, with us. Obviously, uh, we're wishing you all the best with your recovery. We we know you've got a, a hospital appointment uh, coming up now, so we'll we'll let you go. And uh, yeah, um, us at the Unshackle, we're definitely here to support you. Thanks very much, and thanks to everybody uh, in the community for offering their support. And um, yeah, I'll keep getting better, and I'll look after myself. And yeah. Thanks very much. So now we're joined by the young conservative. Uh, how are you feeling? Uh, yeah, no, not too bad. Um, still sort of uh, taking in what happened with uh, with your guy in Brisbane. Um, yeah, yeah. That's so oh, you. You were lucky in the end that the, the the police they just yeah detained you, but there was no uh, physical threat. Yeah, yeah. I think the police presence at that event. Um, was sort of partly the reason behind the fact that we weren't sort of physically um, attacked or anything like that, because I have no doubt that some of the people there would have engaged in violent sort of activity. Yes, definitely. Now, uh, this uh, protest at Channel 7 over their alleged uh, misreporting of African crime, uh, you uh, decided to attend. What was your intention uh, there? Yeah, well, um, actually, it was the day that I was um, getting unpost blocked on my account, so I was thinking, oh, well, what better way to sort of come back by covering this um, uh, covering this protest outside Channel 7. So I was essentially there to observe. I wasn't actually really planning on even going in because I knew that that could probably cause a problem. So um, yeah, no, I, I basically went there to observe and then um, a couple of other people, I know the Unshackled was there as well. So a couple of other right-wingers turned up too. Yeah. And so Neil Erickson and a uh, patriot known as Bluebeard were there and, and you were um, behind them. And then this is what happened. There you go, boys. We're, uh... Sorry, I'm just coming right here. Yeah, 735. Right, we're going to have, uh, remove you from the area to prevent any breach of the post because of what... Oh, uh, come on. Are you serious? Yeah, breach I'm serious. Of the place of the place. On what pretense? Place. You know, yeah, we're just here to observe. On, oh, yeah, I know that. Based on your history and based on what we believe you're here for. What you believe you're from the area. What you believe? Yes. You know you're a cop, but it's facts, not your beliefs. I'm not here to argue with you. You're going to have to arrest me, mate. You're going to have to arrest me. And that's what I'll do if I need to. Yeah, you have to because oh. that's... that's I'm, I'm not, I'm just here to observe for my mind. I'm being arrested. You're being, being detained. detained. <sighs> for what? I'm being detained under pressure of the police. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, didn't, I, I did not just hear speak. Right, okay. All right, here you go. Oh, this is, this is, this is Melbourne now. <laughs> ridiculous. It wasn't there for very long. Yes, democracy in Melbourne. So are they going to... Here's the protest there. I can film it from here. So as you can see, the, the police, they immediately uh, went up to Neil uh, and Bluebeard and said, uh, we're detaining you for a breach of the, the peace and, and you got taken in with them. Yeah, so um, yeah, so essentially uh, they, they got off the tram. Um, I said hi to them and they started filming and um, uh, we, we hadn't, hadn't really even um, approached the protest yet. And then um, immediately the police came out of a van um, and uh, yeah, detained all three of us um, for supposedly breaching the peace or um, saying that there was a threat of breach of the peace. And um, yeah, we, we were moved along um, without even being able to explain um, why why I was there. Neil was not able to explain why he was there. Um, I sort of tried to calm it down. I was saying, look, we're just here to observe. There's no um, there's no issue here. We've not come to cause problems. Literally just to observe and to record. So. Yeah, but uh, still, they took us away. Yeah, if you've seen Neil's um, uh, previous uh, performance at leftist rallies, there's the famous one where he takes the microphone at the refugee rally, saying that they're they're, they're all rapists, so don't let them in. So, and yeah. what what happened after that was one of the leftists tried to attack him, got th uh, thrown to the ground by police, and his head split open. And so yeah, I've, I've seen that video. Yeah, so yeah. they have uh, obviously. They've... There's a bit of controversy around that. Yeah. yeah, so that's probably why immediately they uh, decided to take uh, Neil away and anyone who looked to be associated with him. Mm. Now, you were dropped off uh, across town at uh, Spring Street just outside uh, Parliament House. We'll just look at that. Can you help me out? We'll need to get some names and addresses and whatnot. No worries. Well, you're lucky we already have it. Yeah. Do, you guys are not to go back past Spencer Street today. Oh, no, 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 no,
And so what did police say to, at the, the end of you? Because they, they, they detained you, then they released you. What was, uh, they gave you conditions, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the police, the police took me out and, um, took down my details and whatnot. And, um, uh, basically I asked him, I said, well, am I, am I being charged with anything? And he said, no, not at this point. And I said, all right. And then he said, um, uh, that I was not allowed to return to the area, which is, um, the area north of Burke Street, um, toward where the Channel 7, uh, thing was. He said, otherwise, um, you will be arrested for not complying with police orders and you will face a magistrate. So I thought, all right. And, um, I did actually have to go back to that area. So I, um, specified with the police. I said, look, my car's in that area, just south of Burke Street. Am I allowed to go there? He said, well, yes, but make sure we don't see you. So I sort of thought, all right. Not much I can do there. So um, I didn't return to the area of the protest, but I did go back to get my car, and there was a lot of police presence around um, uh, after that. I'd see a lot of police cars um, going around the area, and I really... Um, on, on the news, they said, oh, they were fearing um, the threat of far-right activists mm. turning up, and I sort of thought, well, not really, <laughs> because there was no organised counter-protest. There was, um, you know, I, I didn't see any sort of imminent threat of... Um, a big conflict like there was at other rallies but according to the police there was so everyone suspects that the the reason police uh detained you is and the others is is because they 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 probably know that uh, these leftists who are at the rally that despite it being uh, an african rally there was quite a number of white white people there um i was detained um about 10 15 minutes before the rally was meant to start but um it was mostly white um, white leftist groups that were there at that time that I observed from afar. It's probably that uh, these police, they're not worried about the, uh, as you said, so-called far right initiating violence. It's that these leftists, they, they have such little self-control. They're so deranged and hysterical that they, they, they just launch into attacks at anyone who in their view is a racist or fascist or whatever. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I was actually having the same conversation with my dad afterwards, and he sort of made the comment that, well, the police are just taking the easy option out by, um, uh, you know, by detaining the people who um, would spark that response from the left. And it's very similar to what happened to Lauren Southern in being moved away from the mosque in Lakemba. Um, you know, uh, if you go there, then you will be responsible for what happens to you because, you know, these people, um, and they wouldn't say it either, but these people will have a violent response and the police know that but um instead they're attacking the oh gosh we're really doing some gymnastics here but attacking the people who would be attacked for walking about where they have the legal right to do so so and as i said to martin before pro a provocation it's never a defense to assault i mean yeah, it's been removed yeah. as a as, as a defense it used to be but it's not anymore yet it seems to be that these leftists, they, if you say anything that's hostile to them, then they feel that they're justified in doing whatever. And now, of course, uh, The Unshackled, we sent um, our reporter Morgan Munro to, to cover it. Now, he wasn't detained, but he was spotted by uh, two members of the Campaign Against Racism and Fascism who... Uh, who con confronted him and like said, oh, you're from a fascist uh, w website. Where's your uh, press accreditation? Or do they want a license for, for journalists? And then the, the police lady there simply took their word for it and uh, sh uh, shoot him away and he had to uh, film uh, across town. It's, it's funny that uh, leftists, they're allowed to counter protest uh, the Aussie Pride flag march or the, the Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux uh, event in Melbourne, they're, they're allowed their free speech to oppose that event, but even us just wanting to cover a leftist rally, not even like being antagonistic at all, that's apparently too much. Yeah, and um, you know, that, that's a very good point as well. Um, I know you would have heard about the um, March for Men that's coming up in August that Sydney Watson organised. Um, there's already, um, I noticed on Facebook, there's already a uh, counter-protest that's organised for that, and I looked in the in the description of the protest and it was you know sort of saying oh the fascists and racists and homophobes are gathering on the streets and i'm sort of thinking like gosh these people will find any reason they any reason they can muster up to disrupt anything remotely right wing anything that remotely goes against their twisted values but um i very highly doubt that the police are going to move them on for breach of the peace in august 
Do you think that, as you said before, the police are taking the easy option, or do you think that there's orders coming from above? Because let's remember that uh, Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux, they got a, a $68,000 bill for police protection, even though... I was going to bring it that up, actually. Yeah, it was yeah. The, uh, the, the leftists who were... Qu that's why the police presence was needed, and uh, we still don't know whether they'll issue Sydney Watson with a, uh, a bill for... Uh, uh, police at the, the, the March for Men, even though it's the, the, the counter-protesters who are, are going to be bringing any trouble. Yeah, no, that, 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 that is another good point. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to see someone like Clementine Ford getting the same treatment if she were to, say, have a, um, uh, ha have, have a rally, have a pro-feminist rally. Why was there no bill um, to the protesters on Australia Day um, in the... No, give it to uh, Tani Notice Williams. Yeah, well... I don't think she'd be able to pay it. <laughs> oh, I know she would because she was on a completely government supplied salary of about 70,000 a year somewhere I read. So yeah, maybe she could actually. <laughs> Uh, now, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you'd had a 30-day Facebook ban, which is why your page hasn't uh, been active, but uh, you're back now, and it's fair to say you came at, came back with a, a bit of a, a, a bang, but you're, yeah, you're more, active. More, more, more of a bang than I was expecting, yeah. Uh, but uh, you're, you're back now, and you you started um, posting again, yep. so, and you've already uh, got another s a surge of uh, followers and likes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, yeah, it, it, it did bring um, about 200 or so in the night following um, uh, those videos that were released, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, certainly uh, this past weekend uh, uh, show, showed that you're in the big game now. I mean, the, the, the police uh, uh, think you're important enough that you need to be uh, detained. Uh, the, on file now. Yeah, this, uh, this is the, uh, the, the main game now. Uh, it's, <laughs> this, uh, this line of work, it's not for the faint-hearted. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if the police now consider me a threat, well, so be it. But I'm not, you know, I'm not aligned with any particular political group. I'm completely freelance. I'm on my own. And, um, but the police now got me down on file. And I'm sure, um, I know some of the anti-fascist groups have also got notes on me and have made videos about me as well. So, um, yeah, no, I guess I'm sort of important in their eyes now. So thank you, Antifa. <laughs> Oh, well, thanks for um, sharing uh, your story uh, today, and uh, now that you're back, we'll, we'll certainly uh, keep in touch. Yeah, great. And now the rest of the week's news with Michael Smythe. Michael, we got to you at last. <laughs> yes, indeed. My apologies to all of our listeners and to you, Tim, that I wasn't able to uh, provide a more comprehensive coverage of Saturday night. Um, it's interesting, actually, looking at the results. I honestly expected that the by-elections would be quite close, although falling, uh, rather remaining in the Labor Party's hands. But in some instances, it actually looked like the Labor Party had swung to them in several electorates. In the seat of Braddon in Tasmania, the two party preferred count actually had a slight swing towards Justine Kay. In the seat of Fremantle in Western Australia, the, uh, the, well, we can't really measure the swing for the Labor Party as such, given that the previous member actually resigned for family reasons rather than um, dual citizenship issues. But he got a primary vote of 52.69% which seems to be a swing of 11.7%, according to the primary vote figures. So he won that overwhelmingly, and the Labor Party won that overwhelmingly. In Longman, where I was helping out the Australian Country Party, Susan Lamb actually experienced a 4.49% swing, despite the rigmarole of uh, the dual citizenship scandal. She got 39.87% primary vote. And in terms of two party preferred, she actually had a swing of just over three and a half percent. It's it's interesting because the number of votes that One Nation received in Longman, they actually experienced a swing of 6.5% as well, despite Pauline's absence. The Greens got less than 5%. Independent Jackie Perkins got 2.69% running as an independent with virtually no funding of her own. The Liberal Democrats were actually surprisingly disappointing 
in terms of their results in Longman. They had spent approximately, from what my sources tell me, about ten thousand dollars and maybe eleven thousand dollars if you count the um, nomination fee. And they only got one point nine six percent. They got less than two percent, even though they had a well funded, or relatively well funded, and well staffed campaign. Lots of volunteers coming up from Brisbane and even from interstate to help out. Um, the country party, um, Blair Verrier, the candidate that I was helping. In her first federal election and the country party's first election in Queensland, she got 1.57% on a shoestring budget of less than $2,000. She easily defeated the Democratic Labor Party, the Science Party, Australia First with Jackboot Jim, I mean, sorry, Jim Saleem, and John Rees of the Australian People's Party. So the final thing to note about Longman is that the LNP actually had a swing against them of almost 10%. The swing against them in primary vote was 9.36%. And despite the mayor culpers of Big Trev in regards to um, a mistake on declaring what type of medal he received, it seems that one of the booth workers who was ex-military was correct, that there was still a lot of anger simmering in the electorate over that. Now, to the seat of Mayo, what we had was uh, Rebecca Sharkey had a swing towards her of just over nine and a half percent. Her primary was 44.43 percent, um, easily eclipsing Georgina Downer's 37.39 percent. She actually had a slight swing against her, not by much, but only by 0.37 percent, but a swing against her nonetheless. The Greens had a slight swing of 0.85 percent to them with um major sumner who is the um he was an art he's an artist and a world-renowned performer he um got 8.9 percent for the primary vote uh reg coots actually had a swing of 7.46 percent for uh, against him for the labor party he only got 6.06 percent of the primary vote uh, the Christian Democratic Party, 1.5%. It was the 1.51%, f- sorry. And that was their first election they contested in there. Um, Liberal Democrats did very, fared very badly, but they fared better than the Australian People's Party, who only got 0.81%, whereas the Lib Dems got 0.91%. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Perth. There was a field of 15 candidates. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A lot of liberal independents as well. Yes, absolutely. Lots of independents. The Citizens Electoral Council ran, the ALA ran, um, the Animal Justice Party ran, the Science Party ran, Sustainable Australia ran, um, People's Party ran, of course, and Australian Christians also ran. The Liberal Democrats also ran, um, and they did surprisingly well. They actually came fourth overall in terms of the primary vote. So Pat Gorman from the ALP, he got a 39.35% primary vote. Uh, The Greens uh, with Caroline Perks got a slight swing to them of one point, just under 1.7%. They got 18.76% of the primary vote. Paul Collins, who is a Liberal Independent, he got 9.54%. Um, Wesley Dupree from the Liberal Democrats, he got 6.67%. So a swing of just under 5% to him and a respectable fourth place finish. Uh, Julie Matheson, an Independent who contested the Senate under her own banner in 2016, I believe it was, if I recall correctly. She got 5.38% of the vote. Um, So just over 3,000 people voted for her. Uh, Jim Graydon got 4.44%, so just over 2,500 votes. Nicole Ariely from Animal Justice failed to meet quota, only got 3.14%. Ian Britzer, which surprised me a little bit, only got 2.94%. Um, Australian Christians with Ellen Joubert 
or Juba, depending on how you pronounce her name. Apologies if I've mispronounced that. Got two and a half percent. The Science Party got one point seven percent. The Australian Mental Health Party got one point six percent. Sustainable Australia got one point three three percent. The ALA got one point one seven percent, which is hardly surprising. Um, Citizens Electoral Council got okay. This part was surprising. They got one percent, one point zero three percent to be precise. That surprises me a little bit. And another surprise is that Gabriel Hafouche of the Australian People's Party only got 0.38%, only a measly 219 votes, which makes you wonder how how the votes were voted on, considering that the last time he ran, he did a bit better because he ran for Palmer. He actually did better last time. So you would have thought it would have gone up, given that he had the profile. But in a field where there were 15 candidates in total, perhaps it's to be expected that his vote would not have improved. Yeah, it was quite fascinating, all the results. And it, we were, it was Super Saturday was sold to us as it was going to be a close uh, by-election with the marginals, Longman and Braddon. But Labour retained uh, all four of its seats that were up for grabs. And the, the LNP uh, lost uh, all uh, three contests that uh, it was running in. And it's basically the result is a vindication of Labour's strategy. Their slogan was hospitals before banks, uh, the uh, company tax cuts, they now look to, to use a common phrase, uh, uh, dead, buried and, and cremated. And <laughs> it seemed that the, uh, the LNP, they got what's termed candidates disease. They thought they could uh, win and really kill Bill Shorten, but uh, Shorten, he's, he's going to stay now out of elbows uh, he, he, his leadership aspirations are dead, Shorten's still standing, and yeah, he's feeling pretty confident. What surprises me, and you as well, is the swing towards the Labour Party. You would have expected the swing to be, to still be there, but not as massively. As I commented when I finally got home on Saturday night, after technical issues and debriefings and such with, um, members of various political parties. It was it was unexpected that the the quantity of the swing was so large to the Labour Party. I mean, bear in mind Bill Shorten has made so many gaffes in terms of, you know, the franking credits, in terms of oppo initially opposing the tax cuts, his captain's call on company tax. That really hurt him, and yet the people just seem to have forgiven him for it. Yeah, and remember in the last week there was the Emma Husa uh, scandal of her um, bullying her, her stuff, which is still ongoing. That uh, didn't hurt him at all. It, it seemed to be that uh, Super Saturday it was called a, a mini election, and if this is a sign of what the federal election result will be, then uh, the coalition, they're going to be wiped out, especially in, in Queensland. Everyone's been keen to point out that the seat next door to uh, Longman is uh, Peter Dunn. Uh, Dixon, which he holds by uh, less than than two percent, and he's talked about the the future of the Conservatives. He'd be he'd be gone, and uh, definitely Malcolm Turnbull won't uh, rush to an early election now. Uh, it'll be as he has been telling us the first half of uh, next year. He'll want to hang on to uh, the top job for as long as possible, and just uh, pray that uh, he can somehow pull off a miracle victory uh, by May next year. Well, he'd want to be hoping. I was concerned for a while that he might actually consider doing a Fraser and um, calling an early election on the back of this. But at the same time, Bill Shorten is the best asset that the Liberal Party have at the moment. Bill Shorten's propensity to open his mouth and say stupid things does a lot more to bolster morale, if not polling results, for the Liberal Party than it does for the Labor Party. And Albo will be back. Albo guaranteed a few days before um, the election, the by-elections, that he would not be contesting the leadership, that he was guaranteed to support uh, Bill Shorten's leadership, even if, even if the ALP lost two of the seats that they were contesting. So um, it's it's it, 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 you know, Albo is always 
has always been a team player. That's the thing. Yes, he's passionate. Yes, he's to the left of the Labour Party, but he's always been passionate and he has always been relatively genuine. And the news got even worse for the, the, the coalition on Sunday night with the latest news poll, which uh, uh, 5149 to Labour, which is Malcolm Turnbull's 37th uh, news poll loss in a row, even though he's more popular than Bill Shorten still, uh, 48 to 29%. Uh, Super Saturday, it showed that it doesn't matter whether Bill Shorten's popular or not. He's got the the winning message, and of course, Labor's got a much better ground game uh, campaign strategy. That's why they're they're able to to sweep uh, S S Super Saturday, and it's it's certainly got. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, scrutiny of the the LNP in Queensland, given that they just lost a, a state election, which they they probably sh shouldn't have, and they. Um, just don't know how to handle One Nation, which uh, d uh, despite uh, the uh, cloud over their candidate, whether he owed business associates money, he nearly got 16%. I mean, uh, One Nation and obviously Rebecca Sharkey winning in Mayo showed that uh, uh, they're still uh, a big threat uh, by the, the minor players. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, another thing that has to be noted as well about the by-elections. Uh, Mark Latham wrote this on his page, on his Outsiders page on Sunday morning. Uh, basically what he pointed out was that the combined major party vote across the by five by-elections was just 55.8%. Um, and he qualifies this by saying it's true that the Liberals didn't fill candidates in Perth or Fremantle but taking the average for the other three seats, Longman, Braddon and Mayo, the combined Labor and Liberal vote was only 62.5%. And this was down from 78.3% of the 2013 federal election in those three electorates. That is, in just five years, the minor party vote has increased from 21.7% to 37.5%, a striking shift in voter sentiment. You've got to look at the... Um, I'll send you the post later on so you can have a look at it. And I'm probably going to use this in one, like, assuming my computer lasts long enough for me to write a, um, an analysis of the results. But it's just interesting to see that if the minor parties actually started to work together, they could actually achieve a lot in, um, they could actually achieve a lot in their primary vote and even possibly still a few seats from the major parties. Unfortunately, it's just a matter of getting them all to work together without shooting each other in the foot as they are wont to do. Oh, that's never going to happen in my opinion. Just <laughs> will will not happen. The, mm. the other major story uh, this week uh, was the big uh, shake-up in Australia's mainstream media, the, the merger between... Uh, Nine Entertainment Co., which owns the Nine Network, and Fairfax Media, which owns the Age, Sydney Morning Herald, and the uh, uh, Macquarie uh, Radio Network, which has 2GB, 4BC, 3AW. Uh, it's worth this merger $4.2 billion, with the, the new company will uh, still be called Nine. Their shareholders will own 51.1% of the, the new company, with Fairfax shareholders owning 48.9%. Now this merger was made possible by the Turnbull government's change to cross-media ownership uh, laws, uh, which uh, abolished the, the two out of three rule that you can own TV, radio and, and print, and also the, the reach rule. Now Labor on the left have said that oh, this is uh, vindicates our objections to the laws because it's more media concentration and of course they all suffer from Murdoch derangement syndrome where they just think that Rupert Murdoch is just going to buy up and consume all of their uh, mainstream media and turn it into a far-right uh, propaganda uh, uh, machine, uh, but th this merger, it's from a position of weakness for both companies. Well, Channel 9 has been going under, has been feeling the pinch for quite a while and Fairfax, well, need I say more? Fail facts. <laughs> oh, fudge facts as I call them. <laughs> but, I don't know, I mean, I, I've i had other things on my mind lately um, with the Stefan and Southern tour on Sunday nights, 
with um, political minutiae and also computer not really working well. All I really know about the merger is that they're... The skeptic in me says that it's very likely for them to, they're trying to tread water together and trying to pull their strengths together, but it's not going to work. They're eventually going to drown. That's what it seems like to me, but I could be wrong. So I don't know. The, the, the main thing is that uh, both companies have lost their, their revenue streams. I mean, back in the, the old days, before the, the internet, uh, TV stations, they, could, they, they made millions from TV advertising, the same with uh, Fairfax, both with advertising and uh, classifieds. That's where all the, the jobs and properties were, were listed. But uh, these days, all the uh, major companies, they advertise on Facebook and Google. And if you uh, want... Uh, got a, a job opening you you don't advertise in the paper anymore you just go seek online and so uh, all of these revenue streams uh, are, are lost and so, and so it makes sense for nine and fairfax to pull their journalism resources uh, together and if if that means that uh, a few journalists uh, lose their their job or god forbid they have to work a bit harder i don't think there'll be much sympathy no oh, absolutely not no, that's definitely no sympathy. I mean, Channel 9 was bought at one stage by Alan Bond for $1.05 billion from Kerry Packer, James Packer's father. But James Packer is no Kerry Packer. He's not his father. And unfortunately for James, he has some issues that he needs to, um, that he needs to take more personal time to resolve than, say, his father did. And, you know, I I feel sorry for him, actually. I, you know, I hope he actually gets better. But because that notwithstanding, because he's not his father, he doesn't have the same mongrel streak in him. He doesn't have that fight in him the same way Kerry did. I mean, Kerry used to go to Parliament House and lecture all the politicians and, saying, and, say, and tell them, stop touching my money you greedy bastards, words to that effect. A little bit more eloquently than that. But he used to do that. And James has been a lot more softly spoken, a lot more subtle about it. He's been developing his casinos in Macau with the with um, the, the Ho dynasty in China, the Ho family in China, rather. And... He hasn't been focusing on media as much. He's been delegating that to other people, but they don't have the same mongrel streak that Kerry had. And for, if I were a Channel 9 shareholder, I'd be saying more is the pity. But yeah. Fairfax had a similar thing in the 1980s when the, when the manager at the time actually just decided to relinquish all responsibility for it. And then after that, it all went down the toilet. So... There's some there's some historical parallel that you could draw here. Yeah, Fairfax has been shedding jobs, had asset write downs, posting losses for the for the past decade. I'm amazed that it managed to uh, survive for for this long. And with regard to media moguls, they're the only ones who, because they're so passionate about media, they're the ones that are keeping this going. I'm sure when rupert uh eventually dies the uh we won't see uh news corp in uh under the the same sort of uh tenacious uh leadership uh but it's also this uh merger as i mentioned before it's it's not just the the revenue that's gone downhill but everyone gets their news from their their phone tablet computer i mean who can be bothered paying three bucks for a, a newspaper now and opening it up and reading it at the table it just doesn't happen anymore people are looking for you know with the murdochs of the world it's easy to become cynical about mainstream media and it's perfectly understandable as well and that's, as you say, that's why old media is developing and thriving, even in Australia, where we have a very small population compared to the rest of the industrialized world. But at the same time, it's a pity in a way that we don't actually have the desire to open up the newspapers and read anymore. There's something, I don't know, call me old fashioned, but there's something for me about feeling the tactile 
paper and just opening it up and reading the paper, scanning through, and then, oh, reading something. Hello, there's something I want to watch, or something I want to read, rather. And going through that and analysing it carefully, whereas if you're on a screen, a tablet, or your phone, or even your laptop, it's like, uh, you just scroll through, it's like, okay, yeah, 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 and you're less likely to absorb it. I don't know, sorry, that's just me. Well, the, at the at the Unshackled, we're we're, we're certainly not are not shedding uh, have much sympathy for Nine and Fairfax. I mean, uh, I started the Unshackled <laughs> because wanted to to counter the the mainstream media and the slant they they put on things. So it's a sign that we're uh, making an impact and that people are turning away from uh, the traditional <laughs> media because they know they're they're not getting the, the the truth, and that's why there's all these calls to regulate social media to crack down on so-called uh, fake news. So I see it as an accomplishment that uh, these two companies uh, are merging. I think there's one thing that should be said um, in regards to the unshackled and alt media in general. We are probably now in a unique position to take over as the successors to the fourth estate, given the lack of uh, adherence and uh, subscription to traditional media, uh, traditional forms of media. So it's good for accountability because if we say something wrong, people say, hey, hang on, mate, you got something wrong there and this is why. And we are actually held to a higher standard in a way because of the fact that we don't have millions of dollars behind us to pay out of court settlements if we get something wrong. Yeah, definitely true that. Uh, well, Parliament gets back uh, mid-August after the, the winter break, which means that politicians go to the Northern Hemisphere where it's warm, and so have a lot of the uh, mainstream media, which should be interesting if uh, all of their empire is ready when they get back but thank you once again michael for coming on a bit later today and discussing the week's news it's my pleasure tim all right everybody that's the show for today if you want to see more of our analysis from super saturday you can view our election night live stream which is on our facebook page plus youtube the next big public event happening in melbourne is the march for men on saturday the 25th of august at 1 p.m at federation square it is designed to bring attention to men's issues and say that it is okay to be masculine is being organized by local social media personality sydney watson the campaign against racism and fascism along with the National Union of Students Women's Department are already organising a counter-protest. Hopefully Victoria Police don't issue Sydney with a $68,000 bill like they did when Lauren Southern and Stefan Molyneux were here and uh, steps are being taken to ensure that those who want to attend and you should attend uh, can do so in perfect safety. The next international guest coming to Australia is former UKIP leader and Brexit champion Nigel Farage this September. He's visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane as well as Auckland. The campaign against racism and fascism, who it seems are getting around and it seems a bit too easily around Melbourne, have already got a protest planned. Tickets including various VIP passes can be booked at nigellive.com.au. Also, please remember we can't cover all the news we want to and go to all these events without your support. Uh, so please consider going on to Patreon and consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the unshackled. Or you can send us a one-off contribution via our PayPal me link. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.